Hello and welcome back to yet another series of international trade. Earlier, we have gone through what is international trade, its importance and significance. Today, we are starting with a lecture on theories of international trade. I am Namrita Kishnani, Assistant Professor from the Department of Management, the Bhopal School of Social Sciences. Welcome. Today, the outline of our module is importance of trade theories, type of trade theories, both modern and traditional theories. So, the first question that comes to our mind is why do countries trade? The first and the primary reason for the same is unequal distribution of natural resources. Raw materials, you may say the mineral resources like iron and steel or it may be the forest products, it may be anything. Next is the international price differential as a consequence of the difference in the productivity, difference in the technology, difference in the factor endowments that is the resources and obviously the cost advantage which is very important nowadays, the economies of scale. And the third and last reason is the product differentiation and the market structure. As we know, the global markets have bridged the gap of all those things. So obviously, the countries trade to take the advantage of the cost theory. The next reason that is why do trade theories occur or what is the significance of the trade theories? The international trade theories are simply the different theories that explain the exchange of goods and services between people or entities from two different countries. The first purpose of the trade theory is to explain the observed trade, the characteristics of trading theories and deduce that what they actually are trading, why and what is the reason for trade so that we can postulate the models and the pattern of international trade to know about the benefits and the effect of trade on the domestic economy as we can trade in the relatively economically cheaper products from other countries and obviously those goods that we are able to produce at an economical pricing in the our domestic country can be uh, exported outside to gain foreign exchange. The third and the other reason for it is to evaluate the role of government intervention by different kind of policies as the government promote the exports and of course they are going to curb down the imports and through their policies or subsidies, the incentives on exports or restrictions on imports, the government makes its mind clear that what they want to do in the next outline. Thus, we come to an overview of the trade theory. We have the different trade theories that range from an era of classical trade theories to the modern trade theories. As we can see, the first line of theory that is the mercantilism, then the Adam Smith theory of absolute advantage and the Ricardo's comparative advantage theory is the classical theory of trade. While as we come to the other, the descending, the other eras, we have the Hirkshire all in theory, which is from the neoclassical age. And then we come to new trade theory, which is based on economies of scale in the modern era. The first theory, which is the mercantilist theory, proposes that a country should try to achieve a favorable balance of trade which proposes that it has the surplus of exports rather than the imports. This theory gained its height in 17th and 18th century and was popularized by Adam Smith in 1776. The nations should accumulate wealth by encouraging exports through subsidies and incentives, discourage the imports through tariffs and quotas, to gain a favorable balance of trade position. The theory of mercantilism aims at creating trade surplus and in turn accumulate nation's wealth. However, the restrictions to impose the curb on imports impaired the growth of nations. Does this theory give its way to the next theory which was proposed by Adam Smith in his book Wealth of Nations in 1776? the absolute advantage theory. 
which proposes that the capability of one country to produce more of a product with the same amount of input than any other country. A country should produce only goods where it is most efficient and trade for those goods where it is not efficient. Let's say for an example, Pakistan uses 15 units of labor for one unit or you can say uh, meters of cloth, while India uses 20 units of labor for the same amount of cloth production. So, India should trade wheat for getting an exchange cloth from Pakistan, which is a beneficial condition for both the countries as India can economically produce wheat while Pakistan has a reasonable advantage in production of cloth. So, it suggests specialization through free trade as consumers will be better off if they can buy products that are priced more cheaply from other nations that is Indians will get a cloth of better quality and obviously economical or reasonable prices in India if we trade this from Pakistan. And the same advantage is for Pakistani citizens who are going to consume Indian wheat. A country may produce goods more efficiently because of the natural advantage or acquired advantage in increased productivity. However, the theories were having its own limitation. That is, it explains how free trade can be advantageous and the causes of trade when both countries enjoy the absolute advantage in production of at least one product. But however, it can happen that the India can have an absolute advantage in both the uni uh, in both the products like India produces wheat and cotton much more better and of a better quality economically pri at economical prices from Pakistan. It assumes that transportation costs are either non-existent and are not significant which may not always hold good as transportation prices do matter, especially when the distance, distances are more. It assumes that the prices are comparable across the countries, implying stability of exchange rate. But in today's scenario, the exchange rate is dominated by the market demand and supply, which is changing every day. So we can't rely on this theory in the long term. Then the perfect mobility of labor between sectors, that is the labor may be mobile but to an extent, that is the labor cannot be useful in each and every sector, industry or even at the locations. This theory thus gave the way to the next theory which was proposed by David Ricardo in 1817, that is the comparative cost advantage theory which proposes that a country should produce only goods where it is most efficient and imports the goods those in which it is less efficient that is again taking the example let's say India and US where India has an advantage in producing cloth or you can say wheat while US has its own advantage in producing PCs or you can say mobile. So, we should actually rely on goods where we are more efficient and use our resources in those particular areas where we are producing at a greater extent the productivity is higher. While the goods in which we are little less efficient like PCs or mobiles, we do not have the technology or the labor consumption is more or we are not up to that same quality, then we should actually trade those goods from other countries. So, there is a difference in opportunity cost and a country has a comparative advantage in producing a good if the opportunity cost of producing that good in terms of other goods is lower in the country compared to other countries. So that is, if US produces mobiles or PCs at a comparatively less price than India, so we should trade that goods in exchange of wheat, cloth or any other thing that we are producing more efficiently. Even if a country is efficient in producing all the goods, still trade between two countries will be beneficial assuming that the country does not have to be best at anything to gain from the trade. 
that is let's compare say that us is better in comparison to india or not only in production of pcs mobiles but also wheat or cloth but still they have scarce resources that is the labor or the capital so they should put in their resources to production of those goods like pcs or mobiles where in less amount of labor or capital they are producing a good quality and more productivity is there and they can earn a higher price for the same and they should not concentrate their labor or either the resources other resources like capital on production of wheat or cloth where the advantage will be at a lower side so they because the country cannot be best at a, each and everything that they can produce so they can gain from trade by allocating resources based on the comparative advantage and trade with each country however this theory again has its limitations that is the ricardo's theory was based on only two countries and only two commodities but international trade among many countries and with many commodities is there now this theory assumed that full employment help theory to explain trade on the basis of comparative advantage cost of production even in terms of labor may change as countries at different levels of employment move towards full employment another serious defect in this theory was that transportation cost was not considered in determining the comparative cost differences between the two countries that is the cost of transportation between us and india cannot be ignored at all regarding theory is not applicable to developing countries as these countries are nowhere near to full employment trade theory the third theory that we are going to take today is the factor endowment theory which was proposed by hirkshire and allin it is also called as the factor proportions theory it discusses the proportion in which different factors of production are available in different countries that means every country has a different factor proportions the labor the capital or the other natural resources which are present are in different amounts and in different supplies the proportion in which they are used for producing the different goods again the proportion of labor capital or the natural resources which are produced in a diff country is different in every country as i told you before that india might use 10 units of labor for production of wheat while pakistan uses 15 units of labor for production of the same amount of wheat so every country has a different proportion so a country's relative endowments of labor and capital will determine the relative cost of these factors while the factor cost is going to determine which could a country can produce most efficiently that is where the advantage lies so based on these post postulates the model predicts that a capital surplus country which may be like japan us or any country in europe specialization specializes in the production and export of capital intensive goods like pcs mobiles or it can be any other technology based goods and the labor surplus countries like india pakistan bangladesh specializes in the production and export of labor intensive goods which may be cloth wheat or anything else however again this theory was having its own limitations because it is based on oversimplified and unrealistic assumptions it may not be necessary that every country which is developed is better in technological related or capital intensive goods while every developing country is labor intensive it also gives undue importance to supply and less importance to demand that is again that we as in india will be able to supply a lot of wheat cloth or so but where the demand lies is also very important the producers are going to produce those goods where the demand exists if the demand for goods are not existing the production will not be there so this limitations have given actually the economist a piece of cake for them to think over why or what are the other contradictions of these theories which was later proposed by leontief and it is known very famously as leontief paradox that was given in 1953 
that is the empirical test raised questions about the validity of the earlier theory. Since US was relatively abundant in capital compared to other nations, it should be an exporter of the capital intensive goods and an importer of labor intensive goods. However, Leontief found that US exports less of capital intensive goods than US imports that is basically the US was importing more of capital intensive goods as compared to exporting the capital intensive goods. And what are the reasons for the same that is it has special advantage in producing new and innovative products that may be less capital intensive and heavily use skilled labor and innovative entrepreneurship. Like for example, computer software, it may be Microsoft, it is less capital intensive, but it is new, it is innovative and of course leads, uh, uh, it needs a lot of skilled labor and entrepreneurship. So it may not be necessary that they might be only producing or exporting the capital intensive goods. So differences in the technology may lead to differences in the productivity, which in turn drives the international trade patterns. Looking at the limitations of the earlier proposed classical theories, we come to the new trade theory, which is a modern theory that stands on the importance of the economies of scale or the low cost advantage. This theory emerged in 1970s and was proposed by the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, another economist who contributed to the same. It introduces the industrial organization view that includes the imperfect competition or the monopolistic competition where the product differentiation and the market differentiation structure exist strongly. It also says reduction of the average cost or the per unit cost of production as a result of increasing output. Next, it outlines the increasing returns, which is increasing the number of outputs in comparison to the input, wherein the countries will be able to specialize in trade with low inputs and increasing a higher level of output, reducing the average cost of production and thus gaining the low cost advantage. Trade helps nations to specialize in the products in which they have the economies of scale. As we have already told that the per unit cost of production is quite low as compared to the earlier as the number of units or the outputs produced are much more in comparison to the inputs that we are putting in for the production of the same level of output. As the size of the market limits the variety, as every market is limited, as we see Europe or Japan, which is an aging country, the market size of the same is limited. The companies which are working in Europe or Japan will not be able to specialize or will not be able to gain the economies of scale if they are just limited to their own countries. But if they are able to scale the production and they are able to reduce the per unit cost of production by generating economies of scale, they will be at an advantageous side if they are trading with other countries like India. By trade, each nation may be able to specialize in producing a narrower range of products that is increase the variety of goods from consumption at a lower cost. Thus, trade offers mutual gain when countries do not differ in the resource endowment or the technology, but what matters is the cost. With this, we put a full stop to today's lecture on theories of trade. Until we meet next time, thank you so much.